welcome to the Gershwin Theater. here today uh, in the middle of a weekly work call. So we're getting to see the set in a state that the audience never gets to really enjoy because it's kind of in the middle of a number of different uh, ideas here. Um, the crew right now is on their uh, mid-morning break, but they'll be back soon. So we might see some people in the background tinkering. Um, with any show, um, well, first of all, before I start talking, turn around and look at this thing. <laughs> what do you guys think? This is your, have, have you ever been here before? I have not. You've not been here. What are your thoughts? What is your first impression, not only just as a, a person who loves the theater, but as a designer? Um, must have been crazy to draft, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's beautiful. What do you mean draft? So those, those people who don't understand draft. So, I mean, before it, you know, is built, it has to be kind of drawn in a technical state. So you have to throw it in AutoCAD or Vectorworks, whatever you use, and get out every little detail on the page. So this is pretty freaking detailed. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts? What's your first impression? I've seen her before, um, but I'm always just struck by how expansive it is, um, how the proscenium melts into the audience and really includes the first few rows, and how the world is just built, even though the playing area is smaller. How just the world is built out is extremely impressive. And you? Same. Uh, the last time I saw the show was, I was sitting like all the way on the balcony, like all the way to the back. It's good to see like close, at least this distance I see a good enough detail that is so impressive to me. Like I really wanted to go back, like go on a stage and see everything. Like I'm curious about. We're going there yes. soon. <laughs> I think your point about uh, its expansiveness, the sense that it's an environment, uh, is a lot about what uh, one of the challenges were for us as designers. Uh, the first thing is that it's, it's a small show. Like you said, the playing space, the actual stage space, uh, is not much larger than a typical Broadway musical stage, about 40 feet from side to side. But the Gershwin proscenium has another 20 feet on either side. It's a massive proscenium, which you cannot see here because we've covered it all up. We've created our own framework to bring the show in close um, so that it can support the smaller moments, but it's ex it can expand to open up for some of the larger moments, like when we go to the Emerald City or when she's flying, we want to feel a little more, a more sense of expansiveness. Um, one, of the, one of the true challenges for the creative team was really the challenge of bringing the show uh, to the Gershwin Theater. Now, this was something that um, was worrisome to some, but for Eugene Lee, who had conquered this space with the original production of Sweeney Todd, he knew that this space could be adapted and could be a place where a story um, could really be nurtured. And boy, was he right. Um, the solution to that was, to as much as possible, to come out into the auditorium. We've added a, an additional framework out here, this large beam, uh, which essentially creates another false proscenium all the way out here on the 15th row. So that even here, 20, 30 rows away, you feel present, you feel in it. And a lot of that is using the fundamentals of design, creating line, working about proportion, to understand that everything's based on a human figure and everything needs to center on that. Mm -hmm. a, large, um, a, a large motif of the design is this clock face, which you see kind of partially hanging in here at the moment. Um, it's the original clock face from 20 years ago. Um, it is incredibly fragile at this point, and you can see um, uh, a crew member uh, religiously repairing some of the small rips and tears. Um, to me, the small rips and tears are part of the organic quality of how a design and a show can evolve through time. Uh, it would, of course, be, although expensive, uh, possible to replace the clock face with a new piece of scenery. Uh, but it seems to kind of patina and age in a way that is fully supportive of the design. Mm -hmm. The design is intended to kind of weather a little bit. And in fact, as the wood weathers naturally and the, and the paint chips a little, I find it to be a continuing evolution of what we've set in motion 20 years ago. Um, these vines were pulled from some, some wood, wooded area in Pennsylvania um, at the last minute. 
um, and found their way in here and uh, got stapled to the walls. Um, they've been treated so that they won't catch fire. Um, but uh, again, I love the, the sense that we use real materials. Uh, we use real wood. We, real, we use, uh, of course, we also do some fake stuff because scenery is, is supposed to be lightweight and portable. Um, but that um, we embrace real material, real steel, so that when it ages and rusts a little bit and not unsafely, but characteristically rusts, um, it just adds a level of reality and a level of grit um, that, that pulls us right back to the story because it's a real story about real people, even though it's in a phantasmic world. Um, it's really about reality and, and people's emotions and love. And so it, 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 we like the idea of using real materials uh, to be able to convey that, that true story within, within the script. Let's get a little closer so we can look at some of those details up front. So now you're a little closer. What are your new thoughts? From back there, you were at arm's length, but now that you're here and you're gone, you can touch it, what are your first impressions just even being right at this level? Usually, I feel like scenery loses its kind of beauty up close, but even from right here, it's, it's, it's still has it. I mean, it's amazing. Everything has been treated with such care. I think that's a great point. Uh, often scenery uh, looks really good from 25, 30 feet away. We do design always, maybe not for the first row, but the third to fifth row. We always understand that the closest person is, is, is a, several arms length away. Uh, with careful lighting, you can often get away with making things not real, but they kind of look scenically painted or that's not what this design. This, this, this show looks great when you're two inches away or, or you're 200 feet away. Um, and I, for me, that's what I love about it. And so I think your observation is fantastic uh, and really spot on that it's in um, how genuine it is that allows you to almost relax a little bit because it's something you know and understand in the real world. And it allows that release for your mind to get pulled in. What are your thoughts? Just being able to see all the details, for example, like these lights in here and all scattered throughout the set and the gears, it's crazy. It just feels like a complete world where everything is taken into account. Like you were saying about the gears on the wheels, just seeing those details and seeing how things move, it feels, it just feels very complete. I think it's a great observation, especially about the integration of the lighting, for example. One of the things that we do as set designers is collaborate with our colleagues, sound designers, lighting designers, and so forth. And this is a perfect example um, of true collaboration. We all, real estate in the theater um, is, is, is expensive in the sense that as we're trying to design and get all of our thoughts into one space, we're often competing for, for the area of the stage that's most meaningful to what we're trying to deliver to the stage. The set really needs to be there because of the proportion or the size or the location, or I need this piece to be downstage of this piece because the order of the scenes are, this happens and then this goes out and then I gotta be able to hear. Like, we're always navigating and negotiating scene, uh, real estate especially down here at the proscenium, where the sound designer needs the speakers to be in a very specific spot so that it has even coverage, that everybody can hear the music and the lyrics. The lighting designer needs a follow spot to be just in the right place so that they can get the right angle to light the actor without lighting the scenery. We want a big puppet that's operated by ropes and pulleys where we see the, the crew pulling on the ropes. Um, the integration alone of the lighting, the sound design, and the set design in this sliver of the, of the world is a tremendous amount of work. And it's something that we continue to do and adapt as we bring the show on the road, because everywhere in a new theater, the, the, the speakers need to be in a very specific space to be able to cover the entire auditorium. And we have just worked carefully as designers together. We're very proud of the work that we've done on the proscenium because it is really, an, an, it's emblematic of collaboration between design crafts. Uh, so it was a very astute observation. Thank you for that. And speaking of details. And I just want to say in the background, you might hear <laughs> like weird knocking sounds or right now we're hearing a hose. It's because work is being done once a week, every week for 20 years, the crew comes in for a few hours and blows the dust off of things, fixes things that have been ripped. Over here, we're covering the pit with new material because it gets old and tattered. So 
I'm sure everyone can hear the sounds in our microphones, and it's so that's just forgive us. Yeah. Go ahead. Also, it takes pa it takes passion. You know, a show yeah. that we the same show we've been working on for many many years. And and speaking of details, I really appreciate like when I able to see closely, even just the corner, the the aging is so detailed and like has a storytelling. Even it's just like corner, people might not notice it, but as a set designer, I really appreciate. Every single detail, every single corner has its own story. And people might not notice it, but there's always someone noticed it, which I really appreciate about. Like the, the aging is so good and the paint treatment, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, it, it's a great point. I mean, he, this just this area alone, um, at the top of the show, monkeys descend and, the, and a map of Oz is, is in play when the, people, when the audience walks in. And the first thing that happens is a monkey comes over to this crank and cranks the world open, which turns all the gears, which lifts up the machinery that brings and reveals the stage and the, and the map flies out. It was important to us to have like a real wagon wheel there because everybody's staring at some moment right there. And that's a real element found on a farm somewhere in, in Calgary, Canada and where the show was constructed originally. But then underneath of it, we cut another gear out of foam because we, there's a nice balance of detail between something that we manufacture and something that we find. And pushing those two ideas together allows you, since the first gear we saw was real, that all the other ones now, whether they're on a tower turning around or whether they're large and representative within the framework of our show, we believe in that. That's something we trust. And I think it's, that, it's because we can look down to the level of detail of a rivet and know that thought and care was given there, that it allows us to relax and take in the whole and know that we've, we've been well um, curated here. And it allows us to really dive in and listen to and believe in the story. I think we should go on stage because that's where the real fun happens. A lot of people get to see it from this way, but we're going to get to go on there and take a look at it close up, even closer. So let's go that way. We're gonna head through the past door, stage left, onto the stage. Great. Cool. Let's head backstage. This is the stage left past door. Usually it's locked with a code, but it's a work call, so it's open and we can go right in. We're gonna head over here. Let's take a moment here to see that this is uh, this is how we enter stage left. You can see here that we're going to step up onto the actual deck of the stage. The, sta the floor that we're on now is the Gershwin stage floor, but we, of course, have a, a show deck that's built on top of that that has all the mechanics and the special effects. So we're going to carefully walk over here, hang out in stage left, and then we'll head on stage. It's a rake deck. I did not clock that. All right, well, welcome to stage left of Wicked. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's, um, there's a number of props and furniture that gets stored here, both on the ground and in the air. Uh, there's access ways to the bridge, which is a piece of scenery that flies in, a uh, big trestle bridge. You can see here the backs of the lighting instruments. These lighting towers fly in and out on motors throughout the night so that we can bring the scenery on and off in transition and it works in concert with the automation of bringing the scenery on and off. Uh, so all around, everything's scattered. Everything has a space. There's notes on the floor of where everything gets preset. Um, let's head on stage. We're going to go through here. Please be careful of the hoses. Step over the hoses, and we're going to come right down here. Uh, there's a shelf there. You're never going to get to that. Let's kind of come right here. Welcome to the Gershwin. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, let's just take a moment to breathe because we've seen it from the front, um, but there's a really unique opportunity to be standing here in the warm lights, down center stage, 1900 seats of the Gershwin out there for all of us. Feel the relationship of the actor to the, sta to the audience. It feels very present. We're standing on a raked floor. Uh, Wicked has its own show deck, which is, you know, downstage about a foot off the actual floor of the Gershwin Theater, almost three feet in the back. Uh, it's a half inch to the foot rake, which is the highest rake you're allowable to do. 
But inside the floor is all the mechanics that we talked about as far as how to transition scenery, how to make the storytelling seamless. Everywhere you see metal on the floor, inside of that is a, a piece of wire rope connected to a winch, connected to a computer driver that brings scenery on and off uh, seamlessly with the tempo of the music in coordination with the lighting cues so that every night it's a repeatable set of transitional occurrence that nothing is left to chance. The cue is called a very specific time. Everything works in relation to each other. Lighting towers fly out, pieces of scenery come on, the lighting tower trails in behind so that when the piece of scenery lands, the lights can illuminate it. Meanwhile, other pieces can travel on and off, fly in and out, or come up through traps in the floor. Wherever you see slits in the floor or little gratings, that's an opportunity for us to introduce smoke, fog, light, wind, sound, all of these are opportunities where we collaborate again with all the other designing team, with our special effects designer, to really deliver things exactly where, where we need them. So the joy of having planned out the whole show to the degree that you can do on paper is that when you're in the moment and you have an actor standing here and you know you want a light to light them very specifically from the floor, that opportunity has been designed in from the beginning. But also allowing some flexibility because just because we thought they were gonna stand there when we were moving little paper pieces around in the model, the, design, the director and the choreographer might very well want them over here once we get to the space. So we're always creating a design that's not so locked in, especially in a new musical, that we have an opportunity to be able to adapt as the needs of the production uh, rely on that. Can I ask a question? Of course, this what is a perfect these? time for questions. <laughs> okay, cool. Yes. What are these um, numbers on the floor? The numbers on the floor are there for the actors uh, and the dancers to mark where they are spacing-wise. So they're called a dance numbers. Mm -hmm. We put one at center and then every two feet left and right when we're doing the show uh, in other countries that don't use feet uh, as an imperial measurement, we do that. Like in China. We yeah. do that in metric. So we'll do one meter, two meter, three meter. Um, and so when the dancers are making sure that they are always in the correct spacing, uh, they know that they're lining, they're standing here, they're lining up with number two, and they've got their toes on the track. They know that they're in the right relationship now to the other actors and the dancers, and also because all of the lighting is programmed to be in very specific spots, then at specific moments, you really need the actor to be on their mark so that the light comes up on them just at that right moment and we transition to the next beat. So it's a great question because it's part of a way that we all stay connected. Dancers, uh, actors, designers, directors, all, we've kind of gridded the stage out. As you'll notice, however, there's very few other spike marks. A spike mark is often a small piece of tape or an indicator as to where uh, some piece of scenery should be preset or where an actor should stand. And we're really kind of against spike marks because it's unnatural. And rather, we just have so much architecture on the floor that the actor knows they stand on the rectangle grate at one. That's their mark. Uh, and that's actually a lot easier to see in real life than some small glow tape mark or something. Uh, also, glow tape marks and spike marks need to get changed. They fade, they fall off, and we are trying to adapt for a 20-year run. And so there's very little to do with regard to maintaining spike marks. What are your first impressions being here on the stage? Um, I have I worked as a, um, a scenic artist over the summer, um, and I just have was wondering how much of this distressing on the floor has come naturally, and how much is kind of designed into it. I mean, it's a great question. A hundred percent natural occurrence over twenty years. Um, this what we started with uh, was hardwood, um, real wood, uh, and stained. Uh, very little natural scenic distressing because we knew what we wanted it to do was just naturally distress. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe in 20 years that we have any have not systematically restained the floor, so it is it's just naturally kind of evolved this way. All these little indentation marks that you see, literally, there's a scene uh, towards the end of the show where the witch hunters come and they're gonna get the witch mm -hmm. and they all have props and, 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 and sticks and they run through and they go, bam, this is 20 years of bam, um, which makes all these little half circle marks everywhere downstage here. 
Um, so there's a nice history and evolution of storytelling, kind of back to where we started, where you're looking in this little pageant wagon and you're seeing the story unfold, and these are the little stories that we tell. And down to your point about the level of detail, some of it we put in, mm -hmm. and some of it we just embrace. What are your first impressions? Um, when I stand on the stage, I see lights. Cause in my experience, um, set designer and line designer, they always argue about, <laughs> do, do you give me a spot for light? Or, you know, all of that. But um, what I, interested about your experience, your education experience, and your minor set design and lighting design. How was your experience and how was your process on this project corroborating light and set in the, in the best way? It's a great question. It kind of goes back to that um, concept of collaboration that we've talked about. It, the, the first time you lay out the plan on a paper, you, start, you may start in a model, but eventually you have to quickly start to put a pencil and paper with a ruler into reality and draw the shape of the stage and start to say, well, we want a dragon here, we want a gear here, we want another portal here, we need some masking so we don't see in the wing, and we need lighting. And so from the first ground plan, uh, we're not foolish. We draw a big rectangle, an appropriate size for the lighting equipment. We give a whole zone for lighting everywhere the lighting designer feels like they will need light. Ken Posner is a lighting designer and has been with us in those meetings since the first day when we were moving little pieces of paper around and that we were inherently designing the set to be the palette for the lighting. Um, it, it, we would be fools as set designers to just literally put our hands up and, and ignore the fact of the reality that we need light, we want light, and that there is a physical reality of how much space it takes. But there are opportunities to share three-dimensional space. So for example, the light ladders and the wings, which we saw the back of when we first walked in, it's important to be able to have strong side light. It's important to have lights that come in low, especially for dance numbers, to be really to, to lift the actor off the floor, to be able to, to light the human figure in dance and movement, but without lighting the floor or lighting the fog, well, to do that, you need a light down low. But we can't have a light down low all the time, or else like the bed's gonna whack into it, right? Or we'd have to make the bed really skinny. Well, that, that's not a good thing. So we have the ability, this is not new technology, but it's, it's afforded to us, to be able to lift the lighting ladder out of the way, move something else through that three-dimensional space, and then bring it back down. So there's some space, as you talk about real estate, that needs to be dedicated to lighting, to scenery. But then there's other three-dimensional space that uses the other element of time, that in this moment in time, this three-dimensional space is occupied by lights, but in the next moment of time, it's occupied by a passing piece of scenery. And so we do need to think of the other element of design, which is time, and that there's a tempo of how things move, and how that two objects can occupy the same space, just not at the same time. All right, here we are, stage right, wicked set. Uh, I am standing in front of what we call the wizard apparatus. It's the Wizard of Oz head. Uh, when we finally, when Elphaba and Glinda finally get to the Emerald City, their journey there is, of course, that they have an invitation from the wizard. And so this is, this is the wizard's head. Um, we're here in stage right. There's a lot of scenery stored overhead here, as you can see, because a lot of our largest pieces of scenery, for some reason or another, enter from stage right. In fact, there's a real reason, which is that the first theater that Wicked ever played in was the Curran Theater in San Francisco. It has no stage left space. It has a very ample stage right space. So even though there's plenty of room over there at the Gershwin, there was no room over there at the, at the Curran. And that was the reality of how Wicked came about. So the items of scenery that come on from stage left are small things, small beds, benches, pieces of corn, little things. Everything that's big is over here on stage right. We've got the Oz head, we've got the Kiamako stairs, we've got the chalkboard, the armoire, we've got all the fallen house, all the big stuff is over here. That's just a natural part of how a show adapts to the space that it's given. Part of the joy of developing a design is the part of making the show. It's one thing to be in the studio and make things out of paper and to draw it and to draft it and to convey our ideas through technical drawings. That's, that's a fantastic part of the journey. But for me, 
it's really the next part, getting it made. And in doing that, uh, we had a lot of different artisans and artists work with us to create different aspects of the show. Uh, of course, we worked at a traditional scene shop. The show was originally and has been constructed for many times at F&D Scene Changes in Calgary, Canada. Uh, but some of the items, like the dragon at the proscenium uh, and the Oz head, were created by Bob Flanagan, who is a puppeteer and an artisan. And so we worked with him um, with concept sketches and research, and then he would make us little models of what the Oz head could look like. He made us like a dozen little models, one with a big nose, one with big eyebrows, one with a pointy nose, one with big lips. And we kind of went with the director and everyone, so oh, I like the nose of this one and the lips of that one. And then he made the Oz head. But not only did he physically make it, he, he found a way to make it kinetic and to have a life of its own. So the head is a puppet. It's operated by a, a crew person on the other side of the wall. Joe's back there. Um, and what it can do through a number of different gadgets and gadgets back there is the head can lift up. That's your cue, Joe. And the jaw can open and close. And the jaw is also, that mechanism is um, attached, not now, but during the show, electronically to the soundboard so that when the jaw opens, it makes a squeaking sound effect. And when it closes, it makes another effect so that in real time, the jaw is actually triggering the sound. That's another level of collaboration. The eyes light up, as you can see here, they're LED lighting. LED lighting in, in 2002 was a new thing. Uh, the eyes can drift around so that the head can stay in one place, but when he looks out, when the eyes, when Wizard says, who are you and why do you seek me? The head can look over there and look down at Elphaba and Glinda and give them a piercing look <laughs> and then the wizard realizes it's Elphaba and Glinda and goes, oh, I didn't realize, <laughs> and the eyebrows can pop open. And all of this is live and choreographed and worked by Joe in the back on every show for the last 20 years. Uh, at the end of it, the wizard realizes that it's his guests and he doesn't have to put on this big show. And so he relaxes the head and we hear it as if air has been released from the mechanism and it falls down and he relaxes the head and the wizard makes his entrance around and says hello to Alphaba and Glinda. So again, it's the idea of working with artists to see a vision come to fruition and know that we as set designers can take it so far and then continue to influence the design all the way through its manufacturing, its evolution, and ultimately working with other human beings to help convey something in real space and time that is inherent to the storytelling. I, I like to use the, the wizard's head uh, as an example of that because it's a real connective tissue from concept all the way to execution, and that it's also part of the living part of the design. Not only does it age naturally, physically, but there are elements of the design that are inherent to the storytelling and have a human being who's helping to convey that story on a nightly basis. Over here on stage right, what are your first impressions? Let's start over here. <laughs> I'm really impressive seeing all this, you know, because I, from my perspective, I can see all, how does it work behind here? That is just impressive and Amazed, amazed. <laughs> You're a little in awe, yeah. how about you? Nietzsche, I understand why everyone's so intimidated by him, but <laughs> seeing the, like, how it's just a handrail with little gears and it creates this whole life in this one piece, it, it feels like another person on stage. It is, it's another character. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, when designing something like this, like, how do you find your reference points? Like, obviously there's, there is, the head in The Wizard of Oz, but this is so much more than that in a different way. It's, it's a physical, tangible being. So I guess, like, where did you start when you? That's a great question. Co core research is an important part of the design process, finding um, specific elements that speak to you in some way. Um, we did uh, have access to the Denslow drawing, Denslow illustrations that are part of the original Wizard of Oz books. Uh, those illustrations are a great resource for the, the simple whimsy of a line uh, and what it can convey and, the, and, and how much expression there is in a simple illustration. Uh, we were attracted to those illustrations for certain aspects of Wicked. We also were interested in just um, kind of the circus glamour of it all, uh, a little bit of the chaser bulbs, uh, a little bit of the frou-frou, but clearly kind of applied decor. 
Um, as we go around the back, you'll see that, again, like everything else, we just leave all the pieces and parts that make it work hanging out to be seen. We didn't, you know, we just found real items to, to show what it makes, what it takes to make it, as you'll see when we get around the back, um, that like we took a, like a, an old tuba horn um, and made it appear to be like, that's where the sound would come from. Um, so that's like a prop person's fancy back there. Um, but again, just the integration of the elements, there's smoke hoses in here to deliver the smoke Exactly, even though we have smoke in the floor and we turn that on too, this piece travels from upstage to downstage on an automated track and as it journeys, we wanted the smoke to be with it and the light lighting it. And, and so um, it's that integration, that level of detail and all of that that helps us tell that story. Yeah. All right, so now we are on the reverse side, the upstage side of the Oz head. This is where Joe is just standing. But there's a little platform here that trails behind that ultimately hinges up and becomes part of the decor. But he climbs up on here. The pedal operates parts of the Oz head puppet. There's a handlebar up there with a brake handle, and that's how it controls and has the gimbal to be able to operate the head. There's, as I mentioned, like tuba horns and other props that kind of are just all there to kind of give a sense uh, of the whimsy of the makings and the workings of behind, behind the wizard's head. Now we're gonna head across the stage and down into the trap room. Okay, we're gonna all walk across here. This is the crossover where the actors go. Normally here, uh, all of the backdrops are in. There is a wire right here, so be mindful of that. And there's one on the other side, not to trip over that. There's lots of bright colored tape here, so you should avoid that area. Um, but generally speaking, during the course of the show, uh, there's a number of backdrops that play behind this that are lit, so our various backgrounds are composed by having really a simple, what we call the neutral drop. It's just a stretched piece of muslin that is just the backdrop. And in front of that, we have a series of ground rows. We have the Shiz University ground row, we have the Poppy ground row, the Emerald City, and so forth. We do that by having one lit surface and a number of silhouettes and shapes that we put in front of it to create the various backgrounds. So we're gonna head this way. As you can see, one, as we go, one of the things that has been adapted and updated over the life cycle of the show is that all the old Parkhand incandescent lighting has been changed to new LED sources. So we have constantly evolving the show as technology evolves to keep Broadway truly the, the version of Wicked that is the penultimate. All right, let's head this way. Okay, so here we're back over stage left and we're gonna take our journey under the stage, okay? This is a special staircase that was put in specifically for Wicked. There's a moment in the show, right after the cornfield moment, that Elphaba runs off and she, her next moment is like 40 seconds later coming up from the downstage trap on a lift to sing No Good Deed. There's not enough time for her to run all the way to the actual stairwell of the theater. That additional length of time was literally too long. We ran that as number of times and decided that the only way to do it was to carve a hole in the floor and have her run, picking her dress up, huddling it all together, and race down these very steep stairs, which is what we're gonna do right now to get downstairs. So come with me. Come in. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, well, and we're now under the stage. So the Gershwin Theater has a stage floor. Of course, we were standing on, the, on our show deck, which is on top of that stage floor. Uh, but here, as you can see, the, the, the actual natural floor of the Gershwin is built out of scaffolding uh, and cross bracing and a plywood deck surface. Uh, underneath here, all of this kind of catacomb of space has been carved out to help support the show and all of its technical aspects. So first, right down by the base of the stairs was where the sound department works to maintain all the microphones and all of their equipment. As we move through, there's pathways for the orchestra to get to the pit. There's pathways to get to some of the traps and lifts for the actors. When Elpha becomes racing down, then she runs over and runs right down this to get up into the uh, No Good Deed lift, which brings her up so that she can sing No Good Deed. So she comes from the stage, down the stairs, runs down here, takes a breath, a sip of water probably, and then gets catapulted up to the top of the stage and then has to go sing No Good Deed. Um, down here also are all where they repair the lights, uh, where the hydraulic units are for some of the effects, especially for like defying gravity to be able to lift her up. We have a big hydraulic arm that does that. All the machinery for that is down here. And we're gonna go down there on the far left corner, which is one of my favorite little places 
which is where automation control happens. That's the place where the computers and the operators run all of the automated cues that bring the scenery on and off and up and down and in and out. And it's kind of the magic behind the curtain, behind the curtain, behind the curtain. So let's head down that way and make a left. Oh, need to make a phone call. <laughs> you can gather by the microwave. It's all coming here. Okay. Okay, here we are at automation control. These are the computer consoles that control both the fly effects and the deck effects. What does that mean? Some pieces fly in and out. They use winches to um, counterweight some of the line sets in the space to be able to fly scenery in and out. That is controlled on a separate controller than the machines that control items coming left and right. Uh, that is um, for safety reasons and for some other technical reasons. Uh, these machines uh, and control equipment uh, is part of what the automation company provides and services for the last uh, two decades. The technology is robust. It controls winches that are throughout the building, um, mo machines and motors that can be controlled electronically in very precise ways. Uh, automation is a fascinating technical element of design. It's, um, it adds that other element of time within space. Uh, it allows us to um, create um, a, a physical narrative of how we move the scenery on and off that's in perfect concert and synchronization with the music, the musical director and the stage manager and the lighting cues. All of that is integral to work together. And there's technology, of course, behind that. It's computer controlled technology, but also there's a lot of knobs and buttons that allow us to be able to manually control any piece in case of emergency or just in case of maintenance. And that's what's happening right now. Um, they have screens here so that they can have video feeds of what's going on uh, from the front of house camera so they can see from the front. But they also have other cameras that are from the side wings or over top so that they can watch all of their automated scenery come in and out safely and they can see if there's an actor standing where they know the piece is going to fly they can stop the piece they can alert the stage managers they have control over everything as it unfolds in real time machines are machines sometimes they break and so no show is the same sometimes there's instances where something starts to move but it's not happy that day and it stops moving and that's why the operators here have to be literally on the edge of their seat being 100% in tune, because there's a lot of pieces moving all the time and they have to keep their eye on all of that. So we rely on our crew to be mindful of that and also to be very active and engaged in the storytelling themselves. They have to be 100% in tune with the actors. Any thoughts while you're down here? It's still a lot of buttons. <laughs> it's a lot of buttons. A lot of That's buttons. absolutely true. <laughs> Is this the wicked bottom? That is the wicked go button. The green button is go, and you don't want to hit the red button because that means you're stopping something abruptly. Um, but every time the stage manager uh, says go, or in fact, for automation, we have these cue lights here. There's red, there's blue, and there's yellow. And so the stage manager over the headset system will say, stand by for automation Q100. They'll turn on the red light as a warning, and then they don't have to say anything else. When the red light goes out, the operator hits the button. That's a very simplified version of how uh, we automate the show. But ultimately then, the operator is watching the screen, watching the video screens, and making sure that everything is functioning as each queue is established. Let's head this way. All right, so that's the trap room. Uh, that is uh, the underbelly, and where a lot of the crew actually um, are down here during the show to facilitate the work of the show. We have our automation crew. We have a crew, crew people who are actually fixing lights all the time to make sure that we always have a healthy lighting rig. Uh, the automation department is here as we met, the sound department, the musicians are just on the other side of that wall in the orchestra pit. Uh, this is a, a, a buzzing beehive down here over the course of the show. Wardrobe is located on every corner. People rush through here with costumes for quick changes. The actors cross through here. It's just a, it's a, it's a, full of activity during the show. We're gonna head out this way, we're gonna head down the stairs and head our way out to the stage door. I will let you leave. So what's interesting about this stairwell is that over the course of the run of the show, um, we've kind of used it as an homage to anyone who has appeared on stage. So you'll see like Shiz University class of, 
and it's just every year of people who have been cast in the show get memorialized on the wall. And it's obviously uh, continuing, evolving, and pretty soon, hopefully, we run out of wall space. When they started the idea, I don't think they actually calculated out 20 years of wall yeah. space. Uh, yeah. But as you can see, there's the 5,000th performance and so forth, all the way down to the original cast right at the base of the stairs. So let's go. Please hold on to the rail. <laughs> It's really about the extended family and the alumni that have made the show such a joy to be part of.